Well, we're in the book of Judges. And it honestly, it is one of the best windows that I know into the human experience, into life as we, as we know it. It is full of human failure. It's full of passion and dysfunction and, yes, cycles. A lot of them bad cycles. But what we are emphasizing in this sermon series called Breaking the Cycles, as Pastor Todd prayed, is that Jesus is the cycle breaker. He broke the power of death, and he wants to break those cycles that just haunt us. And then, and then take over our lives. And so we are, we're using the book of Judges as the backdrop for this conversation. And I want you to remember as we start today that the judges of the Old Testament are the human representatives of God's leadership in a very early part of Israel's history. And last week, if you were here, Pastor Ron introduced us to Gideon. This week, we're going to meet Jephthah. And in between Gideon and Jephthah, Israel, of course, did its thing. They got back into their cycle of, of idol worship again. God again turned them over to their enemies. And so about 18 years had passed of oppression by the enemy. And to the point where there was a, a camp of enemy army into the area known as Gilead. This is part of Israel. And the leaders of Gilead are now praying, who will fight for us? And Judges 11, which is the chapter we're in today, is the answer to that prayer. So I would invite you to follow along with me. If you like, there's a pew Bible in front of you. Page 249 is the page if you want to if you want to track with this. But we are starting at Judges 11, verse 1. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Now that little intro there tells you almost everything you need to know about who Jephthah is. Jephthah was a mighty warrior, and, and other translations call him a mighty man of valor, which is code for someone who has a special job. Okay, this is the Bible's clear signal that this guy is a talented leader and God's next person to lead Israel. So just in that little phrase, it's very clear that Jephthah is qualified to be a leader. There's just that little word, but. But he was the son of a prostitute. So let's keep reading. Verse 2 and 3. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Now, here's a couple things you've got to know. You need to know that in a patriarchal society, it's not really relevant who your mother is. Sorry. It's, it's not socially advantageous that your mother's a prostitute. But in that society, if you belong to dad, then whatever belongs to dad ultimately will become yours. The other thing that you need to know is that Jephthah appears, all indicators point to him being the firstborn. And the firstborn gets a double inheritance. So I think it's entirely likely that dad has died. Those brothers are playing the prostitute card to get more of the inheritance for themselves. But somehow, this mighty warrior lets his little brothers drive him out of town and away from what is rightfully his. The Bible says he fled. So one minute, he's this mighty man of valor, and the next minute, he is running away from home. He's driven out by his brothers, and he is driven out to hang out with what the Bible calls worthless, good-for-nothings. Now, this is a common scenario. We've seen this. We've all, we've all seen this in our lives, but some of us have actually lived this. You know, when a very talented person gets tagged as a loser by others, and then they let it define themselves. So someone else's judgment gets baked into your own self-concept from an early age. You know your mom's a prostitute. Maybe gang member's all you were ever meant to be. You know you're just average. I mean, probably below average. You know poverty is really where you belong. You know, you know. And that's how that cycle begins to form, step one allow other broken humans to define your worth. Step two, act on that belief. And step three, live in a state of worthlessness. That is Jephthah. Meanwhile, Israel is still in the middle of their own bad cycle. They're under siege. 
And it turns out that ground zero for this, this event is Jephthah's homeland. And evidently, everybody knows who the real warrior is because when things get really bad, the elders of Gilead go out into the wilderness to find Jephthah and beg him to come home and lead the battle. Now, of course, Jephthah's incredulous. He's like, oh, now you want me. Now you want me now that you're in trouble. But Jephthah's talent rises to the occasion. And he negotiates a deal. He goes, okay, I'll come home. I'll lead the battle. But if I win, I'm really in charge. And he does take charge. And the first thing he does is to begin negotiating with the enemy king. The king of the Ammonites, this is their neighbor to the east, and the king of the Ammonites claims that way back when, hundreds of years ago, Israel came in and took our land. And Jephthah responds brilliantly, and this is important. Pay attention to this. He goes, you know, let me give you a history lesson about how it really went down. Back when Israel came out of Egypt, we asked nicely, we asked nicely to just pass through your land on the way to the land that God had given us to possess. But you resisted, and, and we had war from the border countries, and God intervened, and God gave us victory, and then gave us possession of that land. And then Jephthah says to the enemy king, verse 24, he says, all that the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Jephthah is crystal clear. The living God did this. God is the one who is in charge of possession. God is the one who controls inheritance. God is the one who calls the shots on who gets what and when and where. And Jephthah says, and, and God gave us this land to live in, and that's where we're going to live. And by the way, dude, you have had 300 years to do something about this, and this is the first I've heard about it. <laughs> then Jephthah concludes. He says, I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. Boom. That is powerful. But does it occur to anyone else that this this guy who is delivering this powerful message to an enemy king that he has never met is somehow unable to deliver basically the same message to his little brothers about his rightful inheritance. Let's go on. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. And then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites and to battle. Now that the Bible tells us that the spirit of the Lord comes on to Jephthah. Why in that moment? Because he's, he's not just a warrior. He's a mighty man of valor. That means he's a man of faith. He's just made a declaration of faith. And God responds by ratifying God's decision to make him a judge by putting the spirit all over him. And we know, we know from our Bible stories that when the spirit is on you, you're going to win the battle. Amen? Amen. So all is well, right? Except for one little thing. We have another but. Well, really, it's an and. Verse 30, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give me the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So instead of going out into the battle confident in his worth as one with the Spirit of God on him, suddenly he feels the need to negotiate again. He needs some insurance. So he makes this dangerous vow. Of course he's going to win the battle. Of course he's going to go home. And now you're holding your breath because you know this isn't going to go well. Verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter, and as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. 
Did you see that coming? Did you, did you know it would be his daughter? His only daughter? His only child? His only heir? Now, I want to be clear on this. Old Testament law forbids human sacrifice. And Jephthah's God's man. So it's unclear. There, there's a debate. Did she really get sacrificed or did he give her to the Lord and she became basically a nun? Either way, Jephthah's lineage is cut off. There are no heirs. And either way, the fate of his daughter is really not the point. The point here is that we're back to the cycle. We're back to this cycle again. You know, the ending was supposed to go like this, that Jephthah was going to go out in the battle and he was, God was going to give him the victory because God wanted to give him the victory. And then his daughter greets him when he gets home and they celebrate and then Jephthah governs over all of Israel and ultimately one day his daughter steps into a big inheritance which she shares with her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. The granddaughter of a prostitute steps into a big inheritance because God decided it was so. That's what was supposed to happen. But instead, we take another tragic turn around this cycle. And this time, the consequences were enormous. They were huge. And, and, and that's consistent with cycles. Don't, don't think for a moment that the consequences stay the same. They don't. They snowball. The damages grow. Step one. Jephthah's inheritance... You know, we're not to that step yet, Robert. Step one. Jephthah's inheritance restored, but the wounds of his childhood were so strong... That step two, he played Russian roulette with his daughter's life. His only daughter. I mean, who did he think was going to come running out of the door? He only had one kid. And then step three, he has to live with the future cut off. And a thousand generations are never going to exist because Jephthah transferred his own sense of worthlessness onto his daughter. Jephthah just makes me want to cry. I mean, at the big picture level, he was brilliant. He really was. I mean, he fully grasped that the Lord was the ultimate judge. And he confidently declared that to the enemy king. And that even though all of Israel's neighbors think they're squatters and that, they're, that they have no business sitting in that promised land, Jephthah is clear that God gave them that land to possess and that God's decision was more than enough. But on a personal level, he couldn't get there. He could not make that leap from God's decision for Israel to God's decision for himself, for his life. God had decided to make Jephthah a mighty man of valor. God decided to call him into a life of leadership and influence. God decided to put the Holy Spirit on him. But when it came to his own life, Jephthah was still relying on human judgment. And this time, he's relying on his own judgment. Those tapes playing in his head. Those voices are still speaking worthless, worthless, worthless. And Jephthah decided that God's decision for him and all the gifts that God was giving were not the final word. And you know what? I have lived this. And I, and I think some of us have lived this too. And that is that we get the big picture real clear. We're good on that. You know, J- Jesus loves his church. Jesus gave his life for his beloved church. I got it. That is objective. But to fully accept what Jesus has decided about me, to fully fully accept what Jesus has decided about you, that Jesus loves you, that Jesus has decided you're not only worth saving, but you are uniquely gifted to contribute to the welfare and the well-being of God's people. And And that that God has put his spirit not on you like Jephthah, but because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you have the spirit in you. I think many of us struggle with that, with that part. It's harder to receive. And I think instead we decide that we're never going to be enough to be truly loved. And I think we override the decision of the God of the universe, I mean the audacity, where we decide, we, we judge, that we are going to have to throw in something more, something extra, to get God to finish what God started. We're going to have to beg or we're going to have to borrow or steal to get God to actually come through. We're going to have to give more to God because 
because we can't possibly be enough in God's eyes. Or more tragically, we just decide, you know what, this is never going to work. I'm just going to fold now. It would just be better for everyone if I just went away. Step one, we let someone else beside God define our worth. Step two, we flinch and we shoot ourselves in the foot. And step three, we live with the consequences. It's a horrible cycle. And so I want to spend the rest of our time talking about how we get out of this horrible cycle. And I believe that Jesus is holding out his hand to us today and he's saying, there's good news. He's saying, my judgment is the the final word. It's the last word. And he's saying, you can get off of this nightmare merry-go-round. You can take my hand, and we can take different kind of steps. We can step into a different kind of cycle. So let's, as we wrap up, let's talk about that. Step one, trade in human judgment and embrace what Jesus has decided Trade in human judgment and embrace what Jesus has decided. I do think this is the hardest part, especially if you've got loud voices in your life questioning your worth, especially if that loudest voice is your own. I have a little quote um, up on the shelf in my office. It comes from a book called Abba's Child by Brennan Manning, and the quote goes like this. Live in the wisdom of accepted tenderness. Live in the wisdom of of God's accepted tenderness toward you. That's just another way of saying replace your own judgment for God's decision. And, and I want to do something with us for just a second. If you're, if you're hanging there with me, I want you to think about a time, and if it helps you, you can close your eyes, but you don't need to. But think about a time when you were in the presence of somebody who really likes you, really likes you, maybe liked you, maybe they're gone now, but maybe it was a grandparent, Maybe it was a grandparent. I have come to believe now that I am a grandparent, that that one of a grandparent's greatest roles is to demonstrate to a child from day one that they are completely accepted and beloved. I mean, when you, you know, when, when the grandpa or grandma's face just lights up with that big old cheesy grin simply because you walked in the room, that's an incredible gift. If you didn't get that gift, here's what I hope. I hope that maybe you could recall someone who was or is truly interested in you as a person. They they like you. They seek out your company. And I have been praying that each one of you can can access at least one memory like that, where somebody really liked you. Because I want you to access what happened to your body when you were in that moment. Because you, you have this sigh of relief, and your muscles relax, and your heart can open. Because you're in a place of accepted tenderness. You're in that warm and caring presence that just, for a minute, just makes all of your fears melt away. God really likes you. God really likes you. And that place of acceptance and love is a place that Jesus wants you to live in. Like Brennan Manning said, not to visit like you visit your grandparents, but to live in that place. Because that is the place that Jesus prepared for you through his sacrificial love and and just that that everlasting love that he gives to us. And it is yours. And it is real. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's yours if you are his. But you got to let go first of your own judgment. Then you got to let go of the judgment of others. And you've got to trust that Jesus' judgment about you is enough. And that leads to step two. Second step that you take then, because we don't stop there, is to trust Jesus for his best for your life and his best for his church. Because Jesus doesn't stop with just deciding your worth. Jesus also now wants to take all those gifts and that calling that maybe has been lying dormant, and he wants to use it for God's glory. See, Jephthah didn't fully understand that God's best for him was also God's best for Israel. The two were intertwined. And the same is true here for us. The same is true. Jesus' best for you is also part of Jesus' best for his church. Why? Because he's a genius. He's he's efficient. He doesn't doesn't waste anything. Frederick Buechner put it like this. He said, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. That's a beautiful picture of the way that Jesus takes 
God's best for you and brings it together with God's best for the world, for the people that he loves. There might be suffering. Almost certainly there's suffering because that's just how it goes when you follow Jesus. But there is certainly rich, incredible blessing that comes with that kind of a life. So I think, I think we got to cut Jephthah just a little bit of slack. He was new to all of this. This was his first big battle. You know, you watch the Olympics and you see those 16-year-olds and it's their first big mental, you know, battle on the world stage versus the 27-year-olds who are just like, yeah, I've been there, done that. I think, I think that it's the same for us. Some of us are in a new season. We're maybe new to faith. Maybe we're just in a new season of faith. But here's the thing. By not believing God's best for you, you have the capacity to just shoot yourself in the foot. And I, and I can testify to that because I remember my first battle after I stepped out tentatively toward the understanding that God was calling me to be a pastor. Being a pastor went against every message I had ever received in my life about who I was and what I could do. But there were these three respected church leaders who were affirming it and recognizing it. And then there was a larger group, a louder group of people who were shooting darts at it. And I flinched. I flinched. I could not hear the voice of God through the louder voices of the people that were around me, and I shot myself in the foot. Now, the good news is that that was not the last battle. The good news, there were more, and God gave me practice, and I, I got better at believing God's best for me. The last one was when somebody with a lot of power, a lot of power, challenged God's decision. And that time, I did not flinch. I did not. Because by then, I believed that God's best for me is also part of God's best for God's church. Jesus walked all the way to the cross, trusting that the Father's best for him would be realized. Now, never was there anyone who knew without a doubt that he was loved. He was very clear on his worth in his Father's eyes. But he understood that the decision had been made, and he went all the way to the cross, trusting that the Father was going to work it out for his best and for our best. Jesus did not flinch. Number three, this is the third step. Remember, remember, remember. Remember. We need to remember God's decision for us when that cycle of worthlessness steps, um, kicks in. Jephthah was very clear on who God is. He was clear on what God had done. But the minute that that cycle of worthlessness kicked in, just all that comprehension went out the window. And that's what happens. That cycle is powerful. And Satan loves to use it to just wipe your memory clean in those critical moments. And so we need hacks. We need hacks to help us remember. The first one is to memorize scripture. It's a very powerful way to do that. And if you, if you um, use that spiritual discipline, what happens is that the spirit then has access to that and can bring those memories up at critical moments. So memorize scripture. Pick some scripture. The second one, you got to know, remembering is best done in community. It is best done by being with other believers as often as possible. It's not Jephthah's fault that he had to pretty much be a loner as a child. That's not his fault. But when he went into battle, he went in with an army. He went in with a band of brothers. And I think that if he had just even once said to somebody around him, man, I'm not feeling it, I think that, I think that his fellow warriors would have said, dude, the Spirit's clearly all over you. You're good. Let's go. You were never intended to deal with your fears and your insecurities and your sense of worthlessness on your own. Small groups are coming September 7th. <clears throat> Remember that what God wants to give you is meant to be handed down. Whatever God gives you is not meant to stop with you. It is meant to be handed down. It's not meant to stop you, unless you yourself stop it like Jephthah did. God does not play games. I think God had big plans for Jephthah's daughter. You know, we don't even know her name. We were supposed to know her name. We were, supposed to, we were supposed to see what happened to her life. And God has big plans for what he's given you and the legacy that comes out of your life as you hand that down. And it doesn't matter if you don't have biological children. God, I know, I know some of you don't, and I know every single one of you have a, a, a circle of influence. 
So remember that God has given you stuff to hand down and there is a legacy there. And finally remember this, that Jesus has already broken the cycle. Your worth has already been determined and God's judgment is that you are a co-heir with Christ and your inheritance has been decided. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. Your father has decided and today you get to decide whether to trust God's judgment to call you and bless you and love you or whether you're going to listen to those voices that seek to shoot you down. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I just thank you so much that you have made decisions. The Father has made decisions, the Spirit has made decisions, and you chose us. And as we trade our own judgment for yours, as we trust you for your best, would you work out for good all the things that you intend for those who are called according to your purpose? Would you bring healing to old memories? Would you silence those old voices? And would you teach us to hear your voice as we remember who you are and what you have done? And it is in your name we pray. Amen.